Uh, um, you made the argument that the uh, gender cape to the gender pay gap is a myth. Yes. And um, one of the main reasons this is, that this is the case is because that female STEM education is at a lower level than it is for men. Um, females are continually discouraged to not go into STEM fields at a rate that's like much lower than men are. So I was wondering what you feel about this argument and um, like, you know, how you, do you like think it should be remedied or like nothing well, should be Well, I mean, I think that it's free country can choose what profession to go into. If the idea is that the pay gap is largely due to profession choice, that's obviously true. If you look at a lot of dangerous professions, firemen, people who work on oil rigs, it tends to be men because men want to go into those professions. It's also true that men tend to spend more hours in the workplace. Uh, it's also true that women take, tend to take more time off with babies. That's not a bad thing, by the way. It's not a rip on women. It's always bewildering to me when feminists are like, it's terrible that women take time off to be with their babies. Why? I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I mean, completely agree. But I think there is a societal discouragement for women to go into these particular fields. I was wondering if like, you view it as like, a problem. I don't see a ton of evidence that there's societal disparagement of women going into being a firefighter. What I actually see is that there's an affirmative action program in many of these cases for women going into things like firefighting because there's now an affirmative attempt to get women I was referring into these to fields. STEM fields, like science, technology. So, okay, so the STEM, okay, so James Damore has an interesting memo that got him fired from <laughs> Google on this. Um, but, it is, but it is certainly true that when you look at, for example, what women major in in college, the number of women who major in STEM studies, which has nothing to do with getting a job and paying, it, women major in, in humanities much more than men do. Men are just interested in this stuff more. That's not a terrible thing. I don't see why that's Yeah, but I mean, be like, there's societal thing. influence that occurs even before the college level, right? I mean, I don't know that there are a lot of people saying to a seventh grade girl who's good at math, you need to stop that and go read some poetry. I mean, let me see. I have. <laughs> I mean, I, I have. I have three younger sisters, right? I have, uh, my wife is a doctor, by the way. So talking about STEM, my wife's a doctor. Uh, my mom runs a comp my mom runs companies. That's what she does. So I'm very much for women in the workplace and being able for them to choose what they want to choose. I really don't see a lot, uh, if you can t tell me the person who's out there going, women in science, fie, fie, then I'll stand with you and say, yeah, that, that person's adult. That's really stupid. You know, if a woman wants to go into science and she's qualified for the job the same way that a, an, an equally qualified guy is great. What I don't want is lowering of standards in science to meet any particular person. And I also don't want this idea that because a woman chooses not to go into science, and a lot of women choose not to go into science, and that creates a disproportionate percentage based on individual choice, that suddenly this is some sort of group discrimination happening in front of us. You said that if you had to go find a cheap x-ray or a cheap armchair, you would go to find an armchair. Because... If your life depended on, you have to find a chair today and buy it now. Yes. Versus you have to find an x-ray and buy it now, you would buy the armchair, yes. Yeah. So my question is, part of what allows you to find a cheap armchair is that there's such a difference in quality. Yes. You know, you can go and buy a chair that's five bucks, probably going to break soon. But yep. So with healthcare... Which I said I, in the piece, actually. Yeah. yeah. So with healthcare... It, if it's something you don't, you don't really want to go like some guy who's offering a five dollar X-ray and say, "Hey, you want an X-ray?" Uh, you know, Why? So, uh, because if it, your life depended on it, I don't think that it would be a situation where you'd be willing to risk the. So let me ask, so let me ask you this: Why should an X-ray cost two hundred dollars, a thousand dollars through an insurance company? It's literally a machine. And an X-ray technician takes a picture of it and then sends it to a radiologist who actually looks at it. Um, well, right, or a doctor looks at it. So. I don't know enough about the healthcare industry to answer that. But the I reason I'm saying this is because what I'm saying is that the health, one of the reasons these things are so much more expensive and so much less competitive is because you do not actually have a free market in healthcare. You have a heavily, heavily regulated market in healthcare. If you want cheap x-rays, you have to have a competition in the x-ray business. There is no competition in the x-ray business. You can't go and look up a list of x-ray companies that are going to give you an x-ray today and then call them for the lowest price. In fact, if you go into the doctor right now and you say, I want you to take a look at this x-ray, how much will it cost me? The doctor will tell you, I can't give you that answer. Right? The doctor will tell you, I'm going to have to talk to your insurance company, or maybe I'm going to have to run it through my, my system, and then I'll get back to you. Is there any other product in America where if you went into a restaurant, you said, how much is that cup of coffee? They said, Eat, drink the cup of coffee, we'll tell you later. <laughs> right? It's not a free market. The point that I was making with the armchair comparison is not, of course, that armchairs are morally equivalent to health care, obviously. People need health care more. Okay, perhaps a, better, perhaps a better comparison would have been bread, right? Because mm -hmm. people need bread. Okay, but the reason that bread is cheap is because there's a free market in bread, not because government is subsidizing bread. So the point that I was making is if you actually want to increase supply, the point I was making in that column and overall about this is that healthcare is not a right, healthcare is a commodity. 
And the difference in between those two views is that if you think healthcare is a right, now you're going to use the government to cram down on doctors that they must serve you at a particular price, or cram down on taxpayers that they have to pay for a certain level of your care, or cram down on insurance companies that they can't be insurance companies anymore. They have to be health coverage institutes, essentially, which is when, when they say that you're, you have to accept pre existing conditions, it's not an insurance company anymore. If you had a fire insurance company and they said you have to accept pre existing conditions, it would just be called the piggy bank. Right? You'd burn down your house and then go get fire insurance. So that's, the insurance companies don't work that way. So the point I was making is if you view it as a commodity, you're going to end up making it cheaper, more plentiful, more available, more competition. And the case in point of this is LASIK eye surgery, which is really unregulated. So LASIK eye surgery used to cost like $20,000 an eye. Now it costs three, dollars $4,000 an eye. The reason for that is because the insurance companies won't cover it and because there's a competitive market because it's really expensive, right? So lots of doctors now want to be optometrists or ophthalmologists and do this sort of, and do this sort of work. This is why my, doctor, my wife's a doctor, so I'm very passionate about this particular topic. Um, you know, they, they call it the, ro the road, which is the, the successful doctors, radiologists, ophthalmologists, anesthesiologists, dermatologists. All those people basically charge cash and don't work through insurance companies. Right? The, the, the vast majority of them work in high-level private industry, and that's, if you want to make a lot of money, that's what you do. And so what you're getting is in medical schools, if you're aiming for lots of money, you go into one of those four. You're not a primary care physician. You're one of those four. If you want more primary care physicians, what should you do? You should incentivize it. What Bernie Sanders and the rest of this crew want to do, they declare it a right, and then they take away the incentive. They declare it a right for you to have health care, and then they say to the doctor, you're going to work, and you're going to like it, and we're going to make you work. And this is why there's a black market in health care in Canada. There's a black market in Israel. There's a black market in the UK. It's why people come here from all of those places to get their surgeries. So here's the reality about socialized health care. Social, socialized health care is good for very, very basic things. Right? It's like emergency care. The same way if you work, walk into an emergency room today and you need an x-ray, they'll give it to you regardless of whether you have insurance, which is true. This is why in California you have a major problem with illegal immigrants who don't actually have health care coverage walking in and to the ER and using it as their health care coverage. Basically, socialized medicine works the same way, except there is no upper echelon. They've made it equal at the expense of the upper echelon, meaning that if you now want a surgery, you've got to wait six months online for it because we didn't give any incentive for people to become surgeons. Right? There's no cost-benefit analysis there. If you want more of something, you have to incentivize that thing. And when you take away the market, there's no incentive anymore. That's the answer as to why, that's the very long answer as to why I say healthcare is more like a chair than it is like the air or water, because somebody has to provide it to you. Uh, hello, Mr. Shapiro. Um, you have consistently praised the free market as the most effective means by which to combat racism, sexism, etc. Correct? Yes. Right? Uh, you believe legislation prohibiting such behaviors is essentially unneeded in today's day and age because you have faith that people such as yourself are conscious enough to fight discrimination in business where it can be shown, and at the end of the day, a business should be given immense freedom to conduct itself in the pursuit of profit. My question is as follows. If insurance companies can charge young males as a group higher prices for car insurance than young females because the former has statistically been shown to be more reckless drivers, does this not leave open the possibility in a free market system for insurance companies to charge premiums based on certain ethnic or racial categories if these ethnic or racial categories statistically correlate with more reckless driving? If you object to the notion of charging someone more based on a factor that that person has virtually no agency in choosing, such as race or sex, why do you not condemn the fact that young men have to pay more? If you do not object to the possibility that a person of a certain sex, ethnic, or racial group may have to pay more on that basis, then are you not failing to disavow discriminatory business practice? OK, so uh, that's a long paragraph. But I think what it really boils down to, the answer is that what you're, ta you're now conflating ethnic uh, racism with risk factors. Okay, right. I don't conflate racism with risk factors, meaning if you are saying that, that insurance companies may use being black as a proxy for heart disease, for example, because black men suffer from heart disease at a higher rate right. than white men do of the same age once you hit a certain age, uh, then my answer is that an insurance company is in the business of assessing risk, not in the business of assessing racism. So if they look at you and they say that this is a higher risk factor, I mean another case, sickle cell anemia, right? There are certain diseases that actually do afflict races differently. Tay-Sachs affects Jews differently. Uh, so the answer is you're an insurance company. Of course you're going to charge more to somebody who has a higher risk factor. That's not racism. That's just the profit motive. I'm not saying that everyone's going to get charged the same in an insurance scheme. Of course not. I assume that you and I won't be charged the same. They'll, they'll me I'm older than you, presumably. They'll measure our bodily health. I don't know how much pot you smoke. Like, they'll make a bunch of distinctions, you know, and they'll, they'll make a bunch of decisions as to what our risk factors are and how that measures out in terms of what I need to pay in order to cover my projections. But that has nothing to do with, with quote unquote, discrimination. That's just a basic market decision. Right. That's so, actuarial decision. So, that's just actuarial for clarification. So there was a study in which, uh, I, I forgot what organization of the United States federal government did it, 
But Native Americans in Arizona were found to have, you know, um, to essentially be engaged in fatal car crashes at a higher rate than any other group. Okay. You think it's perfectly permissible for insurance companies to charge someone um, a surplus, I mean, just charge someone an extra premium by virtue of the fact that they are Native American in Arizona. No, I think it's fair for an insurance company to charge someone based on the risk factor of driving. So what I would suggest is that in a free market system, this is why I defend a free market system, let's say there was an insurance company that do what you're talking about. Right. right? And the insurance company decided Native Americans get charged more. Okay. There would be another insurance company that would come along and they would say, okay, is it really true that Native Americans universally are being charged more or can I undercut my competitor by looking at people on an individual level and looking at all of their risk factors apart from race? Because race is not inherently right, linked to drunk driving. That happened with males because, for instance, not all males you know, are going to be in and of themselves like more reckless drivers than females. However, uh, like, as you said, neither is that the case for But this is why, I mean, let's be right? real about this. This is why car insurance companies have good driver discounts, for example. They have good student discounts, right? They actually do look at more than you just, like, my insurance rates went up through the ceiling when I got caught going down the I-5 at 113 and had my license suspended for a month. They've gone right. down <laughs> since because I haven't had a ticket for five years. So, you know, th this is, <laughs> so okay. the point that I'm making is that if you are suggesting that, if you're trying to line up discrimination with market-based profit, if your question is, is that, can you imagine a situation in which a business makes more money by discriminating and would that be okay, then the answer would be it's a, free, it's a business, you can do what you want in a free society and I have no right to use your services. However, it has yet to come to my attention that racial discrimination in a business is an actual profitable thing over time in a free market system where people can compete because race is not inherently connected to behavioral categories, right? The basis of racism is that race is connected to behavior. Well, I'd just like to say, for instance, um Thomas Sowell point, pointed out, like in his book, uh, uh, Black, uh, Rednecks, White Liberals, or whatever, yes. that the Irish. It's actually the Irish. Right, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, go that, ahead. That, Sorry. Right. It's a good book, yeah. I got that data point. You got it. <laughs> uh, he pointed out that the Irish, for instance, were in the Americas for hundreds upon hundreds of years locked in destitute, grinding poverty. Right. Okay, so you just said that race, you know, if, if you're a company and you institute racist policies, um, won't, like, like there's no long-term gain to be made from those policies. And right. I think that that's erroneous to say, because as you know, inequities, inequalities, disparities do exist between certain communities. So You'd have to show I, me I the disparity based on race and why it's biologically inborn as opposed to cultural. I'm, Irish I'm not are trying not... to say that it's not biologically born. I'm just saying that if you had a policy whereby you... Okay, yeah. I don't want you to confound, no. here's the problem I'm having, and I think we can stop with this, because but I don't want to confound race with behavior unless you can show me that race is the inerrant source of the behavior. And if it is the inerrant source of the behavior, then we can have a separate discussion, but I don't see that. And if you show me that race is in fact that, then that's, that's a separate discussion as to whether we have to force businesses not to take race into account. Hi, Ben. My name is also Ben. That's about it, though. That's all we have in common. <laughs> um, you spoke a lot about how the crime and a lot of the issues in America come with having sex out of wedlock and having basically broken up families. I was wondering your opinion on uh, mass incarceration in this country and how that affects and ties into victimization, um, specifically related to black and brown people, but I'll get there in a second. Um, America has 25% of the world's prison population mm -hmm. with 5% of the world's population. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously a lot of your families where kids go wrong, they don't have the support systems, that's why um, their fathers or their mothers are in prison. And you can look at very concrete uh, examples of ways where the law has not been applied equally to black versus white people. So one example of that is in 1986, the Anti-Drug Abuse uh, Act where they punished crack cocaine, which black people used more than white people, at a 100 to 1 rate, which was recently reduced to 18 to 1 under Barack Obama. Um, so I don't see how you can claim that everyone is treating equally and no one is victimized on a systemic level when you have laws that punish uh, one race that is more likely to use one type of drug more than another race when it's actually been shown that among kids our age, uh, white people and suburban kids are more likely to use drugs in schools than black inner city kids. Are. Okay, so uh, there, there's a lot there and you're right, we disagree on everything. So, um, 
So to begin with, uh, I don't believe in the concept of mass incarceration because that implies that the police are going into black communities with lasso, rounding people up and taking them to jail for no reason. I don't think that's happening. Every person who is in jail has had a trial or a plea. The idea that people are just being grabbed and thrown into prison to keep alive some sort of prison industrial complex where the, the prison masters are the ones running the system, I don't see evidence of that. As far as the 1986 law, I think that it's important to put this into context. And the context is that that law was originally pressed by black legislators from inner cities who are sick of watching crack cocaine destroying their communities. And the reason for the disparity is because crack was more easily distributable and significantly more effective than powder cocaine. It is also the fact that the vast majority of people who are distributing and using crack cocaine were black. You know it's a drug that the vast majority of people who distribute and use are white? Crystal meth. Guess what the penalty is for one ounce of crystal meth versus one ounce of crack cocaine? They are identical. They are identical because they are easily distributed and they are distributed in similar forms. So the idea that this was just some sort of attempt to grab black people off the street and throw them in jail for no reason so we could have a permanent underclass of people with no fathers, this seems to me like a giant conspiracy theory with little evidence to support it. As far as the idea that, that these communities would be better if we just release people onto the streets, so I think it's important, again, to note the statistics here. The fact is the vast, 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 vast majority of people who are, in who are in jail for drug crimes are in for distribution, not merely for use. The idea that it's a black kid who's just smoking crack on the street who's getting picked up by the cops and thrown in jail, the justice system doesn't have time for that. Okay, the vast majority of even possessions that are, pl are pled down from distributions. Now, I've said earlier I'm not in favor of the drug war. Okay, but I can tell you something. The people who are currently acting in criminal fashion in the drug war aren't going to be out acting as model citizens as a general rule. A lot of those people are going to be committing other crimes because this has been the history of the United States. When you make a substance illegal, the people who are criminals were criminals before and they're criminals after. Al Capone was not going to turn into a banker after prohibition ended. <laughs> and the same thing is true for a lot of the people who are committing criminal acts by distributing illicit substances. So I think that to pretend that the epidemic of single motherhood is going to end, all these guys are just going to decide, you know what, I've decided to marry that girl. I'm going to stay home and it's going to be like, leave it to beaver. When they were dealing crack on the corner to 12-year-old kids the day before, I think that's a little bit of a myth. Yeah, I want to respond to one specific point. You were saying um, the idea that cops are going into black communities and lassoing up black people is completely ridiculous. How would you explain the amount of black people in jail currently? Higher numbers of black people committing crimes. Well, that's not the case. That's it is absolutely the case. Uh, there's, it's been statistically shown that white people use drugs just as much as And black as people. I said, people are generally not arrested for using drugs, they're generally arrested for drug distribution in the drug so war. do white people not distribute drugs? Well, they don't in terms of proportionality with regard to, I mean, the, the, the idea that, again, the, the, you need to show me the statistics on drug distribution. So uh, the, the burden is on you to prove the disparity, not on me to prove the non-disparity. Well, you're the one who's accusing the criminal justice system of, of wild injustice. Again, I don't have the statistics in front of me, so it's hard for me to cite statistics on that particular aspect of drug distribution, but you'd have to show that there are a bunch of white people who are distributing drugs to the same extent as the black people in jail and then tell me that they're not being treated equally. You can't just suggest that drug use is equal to drug distribution because statistically it's not.